Hi. Hi, this is Lisa Knight, and I'm going to spend some time talking to you about drawing free body or vector diagrams. So we've been talking about forces and Newton's laws, and we know that according to Newton's second law, that if all the forces add up to be greater than zero, the object will accelerate. We also know that force is a vector, and that when we add forces, or any vector, that we don't just add them. We have to take into account that they have magnitude and direction. So in order to do that effectively, we have to draw them like vectors, and we have to um, illustrate them like vectors. So let's, let's look at some scenarios here. So let's take the very simplest scenario. Let's say we have a box sitting on a flat surface. So what are the, the two forces acting on this box? Well, one force would simply be the weight of the box. And the weight of the box would just be a vector that's at angled down perpendicular to the floor. Weight is always perpendicular to the floor. And the symbol that I use for weight is FG. FG is simply just the gravitational force. It's equal to MG. And the floor is always going to be pushing equal and opposite to the weight um, in this scenario. And that force of the floor that supports the weight in this case is always perpendicular to the floor. So we call that the normal force because in math, perpendicular is normal. And it's equal and opposite. So I'm just going to draw it so that it's equal and opposite. Sometimes our, our diagrams get nasty looking when we have lots of things on it. So a lot of times what we do is we draw a dot to represent the center of mass of the, of the diagram of the object. And we draw that diagram of those vectors on that dot. So in your homework, for example, I may ask you to draw this diagram on that dot. And so you would just simply draw the weight vector going down and you would label it FG. And you would draw the normal force going up about the same length. And you would label it Fn. And if you wanted to find the normal force, it would simply be mg, just the mass in kilograms times gravity, 9.8. Now, obviously, weight would be in the negative direction, and the normal force would be in the upward direction. What if I started pushing on the box? Well, if I started pushing the box to the right, then I would have an applied force. And that applied force would be a vector pointing towards the right. And I would call it FA, the applied force. So my diagram would now have an applied force acting on it. So the trick to these diagrams is what's nice about it is that I can visually see that in the y direction it's in equilibrium. That means that it's not accelerating, that all of the y forces are adding up to zero, that the weight is equal to the normal force, and that in the x direction that it's going to accelerate because there's nothing balancing out this applied force and this applied force is going to be equal to the force that causes it to accelerate. So all of the forces in the x direction are going to cause it to accelerate in the x direction and it's going to accelerate and the only force that's acting in the x direction is the applied force. And so if I want to find the force acting in the x direction, or if I want to find the acceleration in the x direction, I can. If I know the force in the x direction, the applied force, maybe I'm pushing with 200 newtons, and this is a 10 kilogram box, then I can solve for A. Or if I know that I know its acceleration is 10 meters per second squared, and the mass is 10 kilograms, then I can figure out what I'm pushing with. So how would this change if I had friction in the system? If I had friction in the system, then the friction force is always opposing motion, and friction would be in this direction. So friction 
would be in this direction. And we're not going to go in much detail right now about friction um, in, in terms of, uh, excuse me, um, details about um, the different types of friction, but if there was friction in this system, friction would be opposing the motion. It would be taking away from the motion of my, the force of my applied force. It would be working against me. And so actually it would be a little smaller, hopefully, than my um, applied force where it wouldn't start to move, right? So it would be in this direction, right? And that would change my net force now because my net force would no longer be just FA, right? It would no longer be just FA. My net force would be FA plus a negative friction, right? Or minus friction. Because now the friction would be slowing it down in the opposite direction. But that would still cause me to have some kind of acceleration, but just not as much acceleration in the x-direction. How does this change when you're on an incline? So let's look at the geometry of that, because a lot of you guys were saying in the discussion last week that you were confused by that. So we'll just draw our incline here. And this is our angle of incline. And this is our box. So we still have our weight, and weight is always perpendicular to the floor. So our weight is still going to be down here, FG. And we're still going to have a normal force, but look at the normal force. Normal force is going to be perpendicular, up perpendicular to the surface, like this. Right, perpendicular to the surface, but the surface is at an angle. So instead of being up perpendicular to the floor, it's perpendicular to the incline. So if I draw that in here, it looks like this, right? So notice that in this diagram, it is not perpendicular and balancing the weight. That's the problem. Fn is not going to be equal and opposite to the weight. So I can't just say that if the weight's 500 newtons, that the normal force is 500 newtons. It's not going to work out that way. Turns out that what's really happening is that the normal force is actually equal and opposite to this force here, which happens to be a component of the weight. And the weight has two components. It has a perpendicular component and it has a parallel component. That's what your book calls F parallel and F perpendicular. But you could almost think of it, if you think about this, what we're really doing is we're, we're rotating the X and Y axis. This is the X axis and this is the Y axis where Fn is in the, and F perpendicular are in the Y axis and the incline is parallel to the x-axis, where f parallel is the x-axis. So we really have just kind of rotated the x and y-axis around. So the x-axis is parallel to the y-axis. So really, this is the x component of fg. f parallel is the x component of fg g and f perpendicular is the y component. Now let's be careful here because we've learned that the x component is usually of a, of a vector is usually found with cosine and the y component is usually found with um, with sine. But the problem is here that by similar triangles that this angle here is opposite the height of this triangle and the similar angle that will be congruent to it for this little triangle here, the height of this triangle is, is opposite this angle here. So this angle right here is same as this angle here. So this is the angle theta, it turns out. So this means that, that this is angle theta, and um, that means that F parallel is the opposite side of angle theta, which means that if I want to find F parallel, then FG is my hypotenuse, and F parallel is the opposite side. So I have a hypotenuse and the opposite side, and using SOHCAHTOA, 
I, that means I would use sine to find f parallel and I would use cosine to find f um, perpendicular. So it turns out that f perpendicular and, and you have a formula sheet in your exam folder, you always do, is equal to the hypotenuse which is fg or mg times cosine of the angle of the incline and I'm writing with my mouse guys, sorry about that, and f parallel to the incline is the component of weight times sine of the angle of the incline. So if I draw my little um, dot here, the way this works is I've got um, FG here, okay. I've got F perpendicular here, I've got F parallel here, and I've got F normal here. So this is FG, this is F perpendicular, and this is F parallel, and this is F normal. So F normal is equal to F perpendicular. If I want to know what the normal force is acting on this box, the, the force that's supporting the box is mg cosine theta. And the box is pushing down on the incline, is pushing against the incline with mg cosine theta. The force that's propelling it down the incline, that's causing it to accelerate down the incline, is mg sine theta. So the net force that causes it to accelerate is F parallel. So if I want to find its acceleration down the incline, I want to use F parallel. Notice that if I plug in these equations, mg sine theta equals ma. Notice something that happens, the m cancels out. That's weird, right? So I'm left with the acceleration is equal to g times sine of theta. So remember those famous experiments that Galileo had finding the acceleration of gravity? And he said, well, if I roll something down an incline and it doesn't have any friction, um, the maximum acceleration would be when the incline is vertical. And as I make it steeper and steeper, it increases and increases. And he, what he found was that, you know, at lower angles, it was just a fraction of gravity. It was a percentage of gravity. If there was very little friction between the ball and the incline, it was a percentage of gravity. So think about that. That's exactly what this says. Um, as the angle gets smaller, sine of the angle, sine of 30 degrees, for example, is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 times gravity would be half of gravity, right? So acceleration would be half of gravity at a 30 degree angle. Kind of interesting. When friction is negligible, which is hardly never, right? So in real life there's friction. So of course this formula doesn't work in in a lot of real scenarios because in real scenarios there's friction. But in right now we're just making it nice and easy. Okay, so that's an inclined plane. What about when we don't, when we're not resting on a surface. What if we are in a scenario where we're lifting something up? So let's say we have a bucket and we're going to lift it up off the floor. So let's not even draw the floor in there. Let's just think about that we have a rope here and we're going to lift this rope up. So what are the two forces that are involved in that? Well, one, you could guess, would be the weight, right? You have the weight of the bucket pulling down. And then you have the force of tension, Ft, in the rope. 
Those are the only two forces acting on that bucket. So think about this. If I draw that vector diagram, the only two forces will be the tension in the rope and the weight acting on that object. So the net force will be in the y direction and it's going to cause it to accelerate in the y direction, right? So the net force is in the y direction. It's going to accelerate either up or down. So let's assign a, a positive and negative direction. So obviously up is going to be positive and down is going to be negative. So that means that the force of tension is always going to be a positive vector and the force of gravity is always going to be a negative vector. So when we plug these in, we can always plug them in. One is positive and one is negative. And that's always going to be equal to MA. Or we can just say FT minus FG equals M a in the y direction. So this means that if I pl if I'm accelerating upwards, okay, because I have these this negative in here. If I accelerate upwards, I need to pl if I say that I'm accelerating my bucket up at 2 meters per second, when I plug in 2 meters per second, I need to plug in a positive 2 meters per second for a. But if I, my problem, if I say that I'm accelerating downwards, then because I've, I'm using a negative for a downward vector, then I also, any other vector in my equation, and acceleration is a vector, needs to be plugged in as a negative number. So if I say that I'm accelerating downward at negative 2 meters per second squared, then I need to plug in a negative 2 here in my problem. And of course mass will never be positive or negative. Alright, and then what if you have something that's hanging? So let's say that you have something that's in total equilibrium and not accelerating at all, like a stoplight. So let's say that you have something like this that's hanging. So a stoplight. And let's say that theta 1, theta 2, and wire A, and wire B. Okay? Well, think about what's going on here. Now we've got strings on this and we've got a weight. So what are the forces, the big forces that are acting on this? Well, first of all, we have a weight vector. We always have the weight. And the weight is being supported by the strings. And I know you guys are pretty smart people, so you know that there's tension in these strings. So the tension in A and B must be supporting the weight right? So I'm going to call this tension B and tension A just to make it easy so that we don't have too many letters. So think about what that means. What that means is, and I'm going to get a different color here, it means that vector tension B is pulling to the right and vector A is point, pulling to the left. So A has an X component and B has an X component and they are in equilibrium. It means that AX plus BX adds up to zero. It means that AX equals BX, right? because they're in an equilibrium. And that means that the x component, which is A, 
cosine of theta 2 must be equal to b cosine of theta 1. And I could solve for one of these, right? I could say a is equal to b cosine theta 1 all over cosine theta 2. If I knew what these angles were, then I could get some decimals and I could actually come up with a equals, you know, 0.25 of b, some kind of number ratio, right? Now, what else do I know? Well, I know that in the y direction that bx is lifting up, excuse me, by is lifting up, and ay is lifting up. And that together they are supporting fg. So ay plus by equals fg. Right? They're supporting them. So A sine, sorry about my mouse writing here, of theta 2 plus B sine of theta 1 equals whatever FG is. I know that A equals B cosine of theta 1 all over cosine of theta 2. And I could come over here and I could substitute in this mess, whatever this is, over here for A, right? This is a plus, by the way, in case you didn't remember that. And I could substitute this in so that now all I have are B's. I could put the numbers in. Make sure you're in degrees, okay? And then I could start taking the sine of all these angles and I could multiply and divide. And I would now come up with some numbers times the B's. And I could add up all the B's and I could find the mass times the gravity of this object. And then I could solve for B, and then once I had B, then I could put in some numbers here, and I could find A. So my vector diagram that I would want to show on my dot would look like this. I would show my weight vector, I would show my BX vector, I would show my AX vector, and then I would show my combined vector of A, Y, plus B, Y. Notice that I'm trying to make these look so that they're equaling each other out because I want to show that this is an equilibrium, right? I want to show that that's an equilibrium. All right, so that should give you at least a start on some of your homework problems. Um, I know there's some, some questions about mowers and that kind of stuff. I think you can Google those. If you have questions, please email me.